Good morning. I'm uh, Lynn Mulhart, president of the board. Um, it is an agendized board meeting, special board meeting. That's why you see the board up here. Uh, but it really is going to be a workshop for all of us. So let me go through the protocol to get to where I need to be, and then I'm going to turn it over to more uh, to Tony. Okay. In the back of the room, can you hear me in the back of the room? Okay. All right. Very good. Um, it is a special board meeting uh, for today, Wednesday, April 1 at 9 a.m. In the open session, we have public comments. Is there anybody like to make some comments to the board that are not on the agenda? Okay. All right. With that, um, we're going to start off with item 1.2, and um, I'm going to have Tony do that. And at that point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tony. Okay. So we're going to talk about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, also known as SIGMA. You, uh, you know you've come into, into be real being when your uh, legislation has its own acronym and uh, phonetic pronunciation. So uh, we have SIGMA. You'll hear me use that phrase uh, several times today. We're going to talk about um, an overview. We have a representative from DWR who is going to talk about their role in Sigma. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on locally with various groups and areas that are talking about how they want to comply with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And then finally the last in item on the agenda is just some discussion points. And these are miscellaneous points that I put together that that I wanted to get in front of our board of directors to be ask them to begin to think about how are we going to deal with some of these questions. And it's also for you to understand as the audience that there are these questions out there and we need some uh, uh, stakeholder meetings and things like that as we work our way through the, the process of, of deciding how we're going to move forward. So let's get started. I borrowed several of these slides from the Association of California Water Agencies. And so we'll start off with the five stages of groundwater management. Okay, number one is denial, and you may recognize this. This is after the uh, five stages of grief. Okay, there's denial. Uh, you're in denial. We don't know what the, uh, uh, the reality is. We're going to block it out. We're going to hide. We're going to stick our head in the sand, and we're just going to ignore it. It'll go away if we don't look at it. Okay, then there's anger. Uh, we got to have somebody to blame for this. How could this possibly have happened that we have this new law and this new thing that's going to affect our ability to pump? Then we have bargaining. I, gee, I need a compromise. I need to renegotiate the terms of this deal. I'm going to go to Sacramento. I'm going to get new legislation. I'm going to overturn some of the language in the existing thing. So that's your bargaining phase of this. Uh, there's the depression phase when you realize your bargaining didn't work as well as you wanted it to. And so there's going to be some practical implications to that. You know, the situation is changing. How how are you going to deal with that? And then acceptance, where you come to the point where you say, okay, uh, it's going to be okay. I can't fight this. It's, it's a done deal. The law is the law, and we're going to move forward, and I might as well be a part of it and help be a, a productive part of, uh, of getting us to the next stage of groundwater management. So um, various of us are in different spots on this, uh, on this curve. I think some folks in the Central Valley are probably still in the, the uh, upper phases of these uh, lists right here, uh, as opposed to others. Um, so anyway, a little humor to start the morning. So we've already talked a little bit about uh, the presentation overview, but this morning I want to talk about the framework for the Sigma Act. What's the process? There's a thing called a groundwater sustainability plan that has to be put together. What do we do for collaboration kind of, kind of issues, stakeholder meetings? And then Rich is going to talk to us about what the, um, the agency's role are. So some of you may have heard some of these things before, but three bills, 1168, 1739, and, and 1319 were passed by the legislature, signed by the government, and those sort of in an aggregate are called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Okay? The essence of it is local control. Okay? The state listened when everybody said, we don't need the State Water Resources Control Board telling us what to do. We don't need the DWR telling us what to do. We want to deal with at a local level. Well, guess what? They've called our bluff. Mm -hmm. They've said, here's the baton, do it. Set yourselves up and deal with the groundwater issues on a local level. Okay. So what are they asking you to do? They're asking you to reach groundwater sustainability in the next 20 years 
But to make sure that you're making progress, they want five-year incremental reports. So interim updates, interim milestones on how you're doing. Okay. So who's going to be responsible for getting us to sustainability, for leading us to sustainability? You, the stakeholders, we are responsible for getting there. But there's going to be an agency that's going to steer the ship and aim it in the direction that we need it to be aimed in. That's your groundwater sustainability agency, the GSA. Okay, now locally, any local agency or combination of entities can assume the responsibility of a GSA. Okay. Those agencies typically are water districts, irrigation districts, special districts that have uh, jurisdiction over water issues and that kind of thing. And we'll talk a bit about that uh, in a moment. Local exceptions. In the act, they, they identified two organizations, the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency and the Ojai Groundwater Management Agency as the sole GSA for their districts, for their jurisdiction. Okay, so they're named in the legislation. There are other entities there as well, but locally, those are the two. They were given the opportunity to be the GSA. They had the opportunity to decline that honor, um, but neither did. Both have agreed to uh, assume the baton of the GSA uh, in their respective jurisdictions. Okay, so let's look at some of the things that haven't changed with respect to groundwater management. Um, it, some of you may be familiar with the AB 3030 process or the SB 1938 uh, process, but basically the, the plans were, were supposed to be science-based, you know, understand your basin hydrology, the ins and outs of water going in and water out, recharge, pumping, precipitation, all of that. Okay? That hasn't changed going forward with Sigma. Okay, that's still very similar to what was in uh, the AB 3030 requirements, for example. Those of you that may be from the Piru Fillmore Basin area, you know there was an AB 3030 uh, program there for those two basins. So um, those kinds of items haven't changed with Sigma. Okay. It's still all about ba balancing supply and demand. Okay. You can increase supply, you, know, you, can have, you can have supplemental surface water, you can do extra projects to recharge water, but it's basically balancing supply and demand. Do you need water, groundwater demand controls? Is there conservation, is there efficiencies? Um, is there a need to limit groundwater use? Those are all options that are on the table as we move forward and decide how we're going to get to this, this uh, a condition of sustainability. Some things that are different now Groundwater management is no longer voluntary. That's important to understand. It's no longer voluntary. Part of the GSA's responsibility, the agency's responsibility, is to prepare a plan, a groundwater sustainability plan. And that plan will be your roadmap on how we're going to get to sustainability. The state, the DWR, will be reviewing those plans for adequacy. So they're going to make sure you're checking off the major points that need to be addressed, and they're going to make some sort of evaluation as to how well it looks like your plan will get you to the goal of sustainability. Okay, remember there were milestones along the way. So there's going to need to be measurable objectives okay, that you can be evaluated against. So the concept would be if you're going to have a 20-year timeline on your, on your plan, what are we going to get accomplished by year 5, by year 10, by year 15, and by year 20, theoretically, we're, we're, we're flying right in and landing on the, uh, the sustainability goal. There are new authorities given to the sustainable, uh, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency, and we'll go through those in a little bit more detail in a moment. Okay? And the state has the ability to intervene in a basin management <coughs> scenario if the locals are not getting the job done. So if you don't step up to the plate and form your GSAs, if you don't prepare your plans, if you don't hit your management milestones, you are at risk at having the state come in and uh, assume responsibility for the management. Okay, again, the emphasis is on local control. It's on local control. You've got 20 years. State comes in if we don't get our, our act together and get things going in the right direction. And understand that this, 
this groundwater sustainability um, act discussion is all woven in through all of the language you see coming out of Sacramento. Look at the Prop 1 monies that are out there. What are they for? Conservation, recycling, storage, uh, safe drinking water, those kinds of things. This all fits in to that same basket of what are we doing with our water resources. Okay, so how are we going to get to sustainability? General steps. Get your local agencies together, form your GSA in the high and medium priority basins within the next uh, couple of years. Okay. Within five years, you're going to have your sustainability plans written. For us, it's five. Could be as long as seven years for some other areas. Okay, and then once your plans are in place, you've got 20 years to implement and get to your sustainability goals. More than likely, more than one goal. Okay, so let's look quickly at the, the, the dates that we're talking about. We've got till June 2017 to get your GSA formed. So you got a little bit of time, but understand how, how things work. By the time you get various agencies motivated, moving, talking, discussing, how are they going to interact with each other, um, who's going to do what, it takes a little bit of time to get there. So you've got a a little bit of time, but I would urge us not to dawdle along. Let, let's keep moving uh, towards that goal. By 2020, January 2020, we have to have sustainability plans in what are called the critically overdrafted basins. And for those basins that lie within United's jurisdiction, they all have been identified as critically overdrafted. So that means the um, 2020 deadline falls in place for us. Other areas? that are high and medium priority basins as determined by DWR, have an extra couple of years to get their plans done. Okay. And then once again, you have your 20 years to uh, get to sustainability. So it looks like we have some time and we do have a little bit of time, but it's gonna take a while to get through the process and to get the stakeholder meetings and get some sort of consensus on what the plan is and how we're gonna get to that goal at the end. Not the least of which is how are we going to define what those goals are we're aiming at. Okay, so high and, and medium priority basins. Um, DWR looked at their CASGEM data, which was basically reporting groundwater elevation to the state. They took a look at that, determined uh, areas that were heavily dependent on groundwater, looked at the, the, the areas uh, population, how much of the irrigated agriculture, that kind of thing. And so they classified areas as high, medium, or low. And so Many of the basins, 125, are in the higher or medium category. Okay. Low priority basins are not required to do a plan, but they're urged to do a plan. So you can see our little part of the world is uh, right over here. And so we're in the orange and yellow categories. That gives us the high and medium uh, priorities. So in a tabular format, these are the basins or sub-basins that are within United's jurisdiction. So we can see there's the basin, Piru, Fillmore, Santa Paula Mound, the Oxnard Plain, which includes the Four Bay, okay, then Pleasant Valley and Las Posas, all are high or medium, and the little asterisk after them means that they are uh, identified as in critical overdraft. Okay. So that means we have the shorter of the two deadlines to get our groundwater sustainability plan. Okay, some ex exemptions we want to talk about here. The groundwater sustainability plan doesn't apply to pre-existing adjudicated basins. So if you look in the act, there's actually a list of basins that are adjudicated and there are others that are almost through the process of becoming adjudicated and the, the groundwater sustainability plan requirement does not apply to them. That includes the Santa Paula Basin for us uh, locally here. Okay. It doesn't mean they don't have to do anything. They still have to report pumping and water uses and changes in storage within the basin to the DWR every year, but they're exempt from the, the broader requirements of the groundwater sustainability plan. The concept being that they're under the jurisdiction of the court, the court's told them what to do, and they're managing in accordance with what the court has said to do. Okay. If you have some other kind of plan, some kind of groundwater management plan out there, can you say to the DWR, I'm already doing a functional equivalent to a groundwater sustainability plan and we've been doing it for the last 15 years. As long as you can demonstrate that you've had sustainable management, 
and you've been doing it for quite some time, you, you can petition to say, I've already got the essence of a groundwater sustainability plan. Who might this apply to? Uh, Orange County Water District, for example. They've got a very elaborate system going on there, very elaborate plan uh, for how they manage the, the groundwater and basin. So they may, based on conversations I've had with them, they may go to the state and say, we've already got a plan that does the same thing. Why do we have to write another plan? OK. Again, who's in the GSA or who can be within the GSA? Local agency or combination of agencies may elect to be a groundwater sustainability agency. And what kind of local agency? Well, if you have something to do with water supply, water management, land use, uh, a city, uh, those kinds of things can, a, can elect to be a GSA. Does it mean they are the GSA? Hmm, not necessarily. If there's more than one entity within a basin that raises their hand and says, we want to be a groundwater sustainability agency, now you have a situation where you have multiple agencies, a single basin, and how are you going to coordinate amongst yourselves um, to do that? If on the other hand, no one raises their hand and says, I'm, I'll, I'll take the baton and, and I'll be the GSA, the county then becomes the default agency. The County of Ventura would become the default agency. Okay. Okay. So let's say we've declared, we've elected, we're going to be a GSA. What do we do? We got to have a public meeting. There are hearings associated with that. Okay. Where they get feedback from stakeholders on a particular entity uh, becoming a GSA. Once you elect to become the GSA, things start happening fairly rapidly. There's the requirement for stakeholder meetings. Um, this phrase is used a lot. All interest of all beneficial uses and users of groundwater must be considered. Okay. So that's everything dealing with water has to be considered when you're developing, when you're electing to be the GSA and then moving forward in your groundwater sustainability plan development process. So who is that? You know, ag and domestic users, m and tribes, environmental users, which are kind of not defined in the act as to what that really means. What is an environmental user of water? I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, disadvantaged communities, okay? And anybody else who might be interested has to be contacted and brought on board to discuss how we're going to get to sustainability. There is a lot of outreach, a lot of stakeholder um, uh, action that goes along with this. So what is the GSA supposed to do? Well, they're going to lead the sustainability effort. Okay. They're responsible for maintaining groundwater sustainability. There are going to be annual reports that go to the DWR. The usual technical stuff, groundwater elevations, how much water was used, what was recharged, um, changes in groundwater storage, the usual kinds of things that go into these, these documents. Okay. They're going to be responsible for reviewing your progress towards achieving the goals outlined in the groundwater sustainability plan. Remember your GSA is now accountable to the DWR. The DWR will be doing five-year check-ins to see how you're doing uh, on your process. Okay, what is sustainable groundwater management? Well, it's basically planning an implementation of, of a program that doesn't cause undesirable results. So there was nothing in the act that says, oh, hey, if water levels drop by more than 100 feet, then that's a problem, or it drops by 10 feet, that's a problem, or water quality goes from this to that. It's not in there, okay? It's very loosely defined in an attempt to make it applicable to a wide range of, of conditions. So if you've got chronic lowering of groundwater levels, okay, depletion of supply, reductions in storage, if you have seawater intrusion, degraded water quality, land subsidence, which the Central Valley is experiencing, uh, pretty dramatic 
uh, impacts from subsidence these days, and surface water depletions have an adverse effect on the beneficial use of that water. One of the things that's really coming through in this act is the interconnection between surface water and groundwater. So it isn't adequate to just say, oh, there's a 10,000 acre feet of pumping in the basin. Um, you're gonna have to decide, yeah, well, there's 10,000 acre feet of pumping in the basin, but what's the impact on your surface water supplies? Because those go for environmental water uses or recharging of the aquifer and that kind of thing. So there was a lot more intertwining of the variables than what there were in past um, groundwater management efforts and also within many of the existing adjudications that are out there of groundwater basins, um, this is a far more involved and far more detailed um, uh, evaluation. Okay, what are the authorities of it? Um, I like the phrase, may perform any act necessary or proper to carry out the purposes of this act, including, for example, all of those things. Okay. So the GSA has been given a lot of authority, and this is one of the things that various agencies have told the state in the past is that you called me a water replenishment district, a water uh, conservation district, an irrigation district, a, a whatever kind of district, and I don't have the authority to do all of the things I need to do to be able to get sound groundwater management practices in play. And so Sacramento listened. Well. At least this time they listened. Okay. And they said, all right, we're going to give you the baton and we're going to give you a whole basket full of tools to use if you need them. So you have the ability as the GSA to require reporting of groundwater extractions. That's not necessarily things that are new in our part of the world because people have been reporting to the, the GMA or United or whomever for quite some time. And so that's kind of like the thing we do here. Um, but there are the parts of the state where they don't record their pumping, they don't report to anybody. And uh, it's, a, it's a very much a paradigm shift for them. They have a total new mindset that they have to get to. They're still in the early phases of the five stages of groundwater management. They're still up in the denial and anger uh, kind of categories there. And so um, we're a little bit beyond that, I think, because we're already doing some of these things. But it does have a pretty broad reach. It has the ability to impose uh, restrictions on well spacings. Hey, it has the ability to control ext uh, extractions from various wells. Uh, it can collect fees, can do monitoring and compliance. It can prepare a following program, a voluntary following program that will become part of your plan, uh, your groundwater sustainability plan. So the GSA has been given the tools to do the job that the state has asked them to do. So if your organization is choosing to be a GSA, understand that you're going to be given a, a basket full of tools. And the expectation is that if it's necessary, you're going to use those tools. It'll be less a situation as it was in the past where we would say, I don't have the authority to do X, Y, or Z. It's not in our enabling legislation to do that. Well, they've removed a lot of those caveats here and given you that authority. It's not that you have to do these things, but you can do these things. You have the ability to do them if that helps you get to sustainability. Okay, so we talked about the GSAs. How are we going to prepare the sustainability plans? Well, you can have one groundwater sustainability agency cover a whole basin and they write one plan. You can have multiple, two, four, five, whatever it is, GSA is in a basin and they can collaborate together and write one plan. Or you can have multiple GSAs and they can each write their own plan that's applicable only to their own area with the understanding that they've all coordinated together and they're all working towards the same goals using the same data in the same way and are on the same 20 year uh, timeline kind of thing. Does that make sense? Because it didn't the first time I read it. Okay. So there are multiple ways to go about that. Now, 
We'll talk about in, in a little bit later session, what are some of the, the options? There's the options if maybe you have th three or four entities who all say, I want to be a GSA. What could, how could that be here locally? You could have the county. They overlay every basin, right? So that's one entity that could be there. Maybe you have a water district, maybe you have a, ci a city there, and maybe you have a large irrigation district or something like that. Some other entity that would qualify as that, okay? They can all go their own way, do their own thing, write their own plans, but they gotta coordinate. To me, that seems like a logistical nightmare, but that's just me. What else could they do? They can come together under a single entity. For example, a joint powers authority, or some other MOU or legal, legal uh, mechanism to put them together and have that legal entity be the GSA, but it's represented by those entities, those four entities in this case that we're using. Okay? So that's another way that they can come together. So there are lots of variables. They were very uh, uh, open when the legislation was prepared and giving you multiple ways to do that. So there's the example in the Central Valley where there's a groundwater basin that actually lies in two counties. And there's three cities, you know, a couple of large irrigation districts, uh, uh, water replenishment districts, and that. so they have this basin with seven or eight entities. And if they all decide they want to cookie cutter their little piece, then there's all the little donut hole areas that don't get covered, so the county has to fill in with that. So you can see how it could quite rapidly be a logistical and administrative uh, a challenge to uh, herd all the cats to get that kind of process uh, going forward. Any questions on that? This is usually one where, where people get confused about one versus two versus, yeah. Hang on, we gotta get a mic to you because we're recording. So my question for you is, um, let's look at our Fox Canyon GMA. We have five basins within its jurisdiction. So are we looking at uh, one plan to cover all five basins or one plan for each basin? Or are we looking at the last point you have there, taking our current um, groundwater management plan and, and modifying it? Do you know what, where we're leading towards on that at all? Um, uh I don't know who we is because um, I'm not the GMA, right? So I, I can't speak for the GMA. I've heard discussions in all different directions, okay? I don't know that a decision has been made on that, so that'd be an appropriate question to uh, talk to the, the Fox Canyon folks about. Okay. Okay, was it, was it over here? No. We're good? All right. Yeah. Does a mutual water company count as a uh, irrigation district similar to what a true irrigation district is up in the San Joaquin Valley that's formed? It's my understanding that right now the way the legislation is being interpreted is that they do not. Now there are there is at least one bill I understand wandering around the halls of, of Sacramento that talks about expanding that and potentially giving uh, uh, mutual water districts a, uh, an ability to be on the GSA. Tony, I do have a question or a comment. Yeah. We talked about connecting with your mic, please. Sorry. I get the wire connection. Uh, my comment question would be is, uh, you know, we talked about the connection of groundwater and surface water. Mm -hmm. Where does that fall under the loop of the like endangered species and the federal, the fed dudes and those guys and what we're trying to accomplish here? Is the state, what position and definition are they looking at when we're talking about surface water, uh, surface water replenishing through our, our, uh, our uh, like the four bay area mm -hmm. and percolation down mm -hmm. the river and balancing that with endangered species like the uh, steelhead. The shorter answer is it all has to be considered. Okay. Does this trump the Endangered Species Act? No, it does not. 
This is a state law. That's have, a federal law. Do we have, need to have NIMPS at this discussion process? Oh, whenever we go forward with a groundwater sustainability plan for the basins, I think they will have a seat at the table to discuss what's going on. They will be one of the stakeholder groups that will have to be contacted to discuss. Here's our groundwater sustainability plan moving forward. They fall under, in my definition, the environmental water users category there. And so they're going to have to be consulted. In fact, if they still have a couple of in fact, in, in, as part of the uh, Stillhead Recovery Plan that we are dealing with under the ESA, <laughs> I'm trying to make it so I'm not blocking anybody. Uh, it, it specifically states that groundwater pumping has an impact on Stillhead, the Stillhead Recovery, so it definitely will be built into the GSP how to deal with that and not affect it. Remember, when you're doing your plans, you're going to have to have coordination agreements. So if you've got multiple GSAs in a basin, you've got a city and a county and an irrigation district, and they've all decided to go their own way and do their own thing, they need to have an intra-basin coordination agreement between all those and the, how are we going to collect the data, how are we going to pay for everything, how is this all going to work together, we all agree on the timeline for preparing the plan and what dates we're going to come in and, and, and land safely at the, at the sustainability goal. In that same vein, you also need to have coordination agreements inter-basin, meaning who's upgrading from you, who's downgrading from you. You need to know what they're doing, they need to know what you're doing, and you need to know what you're doing affects your neighbor downgrading from you. Okay? So there are coordination agreements that have to be put together on how you're going to share information. And at some point in time, as you're writing and crafting your plans and your goals, you have to be talking to the basin upstream or downstream, your neighbors, in the sense, to see what actions they're taking and what their goals and plans are. Okay? What becomes difficult is if you're a medium or high priority basin and you have a timeline and your neighbor is not. And they're on their own timeline, which may be much longer than your timeline. So that's something that, that has to be worked out and, and um, has not been addressed to my, to my thinking so far in the act or in any of the cleanup language. Yeah, hang on a second, we'll grab that. Where did that microphone go to? Up here, please. Is the state of California creating a new um, agency to manage all this another le level um, within the existing water um, hierarchy? No. It's my understanding, no. Rich is here from DWR. Um, let's just see if, Rich, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I wouldn't say we're creating a new agency. We are kind of reorganizing, like within the department, we're reorganizing ourselves um, to more effectively implement our rules, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And the same, same with the state water board, they're kind of reorganizing with themselves. We're coordinating with each other, but there's not a new uh, agency. And that sort of a corollary to that, that's one of the conversations that that folks have been having with DWR and, and, and our legislative representatives about, okay, you gave us this program, you want us to implement that, but obviously the State Water Resources Control Board and the DWR are integral in that. They're going to have timelines and things that they need to do and we're going to be dependent upon them for doing those things in those timelines. Please make sure they have the funding to be able to, to, to have the staff to be able to do that. Otherwise, the whole system crumbles because of lack of funding within DWR you are or the state board so we've been uh, moderately vocal with folks to say you know this this is only one piece of it we need to have the um, the regulatory arm at the state level uh, be properly funded and staffed so that things can be moving along in a timeline we don't want to get in a situation where we have a five-year plan that we've turned in and it takes them five or six years to review it and you're already beyond your milestones and on to the next thing. We've got to have a little more timely back and forth on that to make this plan uh, work effectively. Yeah, Mike's coming right behind you. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, how do the <clears throat> uncertainties of the drought enter into 
defining what sustainability is and how you achieve it. I think it, I think it's important to understand that that sustainability is the goal, and ha we have to define it. How are we want to define it? The the concept in, in my mind is is that the drought is just one hydrologic condition we experience. Sometimes we have three years that are really wet in a row. Sometimes we have four years that are really dry in a row, and that that range, that extremes of things have to be factored into your plan. It's not necessarily that, oh, this year is a bad year, so everything goes to hell in a handbasket real quick. It's that how does this fit in our overall plan? What are we doing during the wet years to make sure we have adequate supplies and we are sustainable through the dry periods? I think that's, we have to not think too narrow on this and think a little broader time frame when we talk about uh, sustainability. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, enhanced opportunities for conjunctive use of surface and groundwater. We already do a fair amount of that in this county already. So this is not a new concept for, um, uh, for Ventura County folk to do. There are a lot of things that are going to go into your groundwater sustainability plan and just as a sort of a laundry list of things that have to be there. You know, what is your water demand? What's the beneficial use of that water? What is it going to be used for? Is that beneficial? This all rolls back into public trust doctrine stuff and things like that. Environmental use is kind of a new one that goes on there. What are we going to, what are we going to do with that? What does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? We don't know, the, the act was kind of vague as to, to what they mean by that. I asked for clarification and, and uh, didn't get much help uh, back on, uh, from uh, Sacramento. They want to know groundwater elevations, recharge, subsidence, all those kinds of things are going to be um, in the plan. One of the things that's gonna drive you, uh, drive a lot of your programs is what's your sustainable yield. What's the sustainable yield of the basin? Uh, until a few months ago, most of us would have called that the safe yield of the basin, but the new buzzword is sustainable yield. So they're roughly the same definition. Okay, we've talked about those kinds of things. Uh, I mentioned DWR, I'm not gonna say too much about that because Rich is here to, to fill us in on all the details, but they have some tasks to do. They've gotta fill in um, what basins are high, medium, or low priority. They're there to provide technical assistance. For those areas that don't have agencies on board in their area who have groundwater departments, have engineering departments, are used to dealing with groundwater issues, they may need technical assistance okay, to get going. And that's one of the tasks that the DWR has been given. So they're gonna evaluate your basins, um, that kind of thing, and maybe help talk about uh, um, evaluating sustainability plans uh, for uh, consistency between uh, neighboring basins. State Water Resources Control Board has a role. They can intervene if things don't go well locally. So they're giving you plenty of uh, opportunities to get your act uh, together locally before they step in. Okay? If you're not getting things stepped in, you can be designated probationary in your basin and if you're probationary then it has implications for your ability to get grant funding and other things uh, uh, happen that are generally not uh, not things you want to have happen they're negative events uh, let's see probationary status okay so what about water rights hey okay, so he's the the elephant in the room um, neither sigma nor your groundwater sustainability plan can alter an existing groundwater or surface water right. Okay. However, like other property rights, it can be regulated. Okay. It can be regulated. Okay. So the, the last is out of the, uh, out of the act. <coughs> Preserve the security of the water rights to the greatest extent possible consistent with the sustainable management of groundwater. Okay. So this will be, a, a, I imagine, a legal bone of contention for some folks. You may say I have a legal right to pump 100 acre feet or whatever the number is uh, of water. Okay. But there may be groundwater sustainability plan actions that say that 100 needs to be reduced to 80 to get us to a sustainable level. Your right hasn't been touched, but your ability to, 
to uh, use all of that right has been. Okay? So the, uh, the attorneys I've talked to have explained it to me and says, you have your house, you own the property. Well, in my case, the bank owns it, but you know what I mean. You own your property, okay? But that doesn't mean I can do anything I want with that property. I can't put a cell tower in my backyard if I want to. I can't put a pig farm in my backyard if I want to. Okay, there are restrictions on my property right there. So anyway, this will be a, a bone of contention and will be talked about, uh, I'm sure, in many circles. Yeah. Hang on, microphone. Where, where it went? Oh, we gotta get you. We gotta get you recorded. Richard Sweet, uh, resident of Ventura. So, um, during the drought, it seems that we need some um, pumping allocations and limits now, and that we shouldn't. Nobody should be waiting for a plan to be developed, because. Um, it seems like what you're implying is that uh, full water rights are only available when the basins are full. But when they're empty like now, maybe, you know, everybody should be limited uh, according to how depleted the, the aquifer is. And those are the kinds of things that your groundwater sustainability plan has to address. What are you going to do during periods of plenty of water and what are you going to do during periods of drought? Are you going to operate differently so that when you go through the peak wet years and you go through the drought years, that, that over your, your sustainability window, did you keep things in order? Did you balance yourself out? Were you sustainable over that time frame? Okay, nothing we have that we're talking about today does anything to help us in our current situation today. Okay? Those are separate issues beyond the GSA. Um, the GSAs, with the exception of Fox Canyon and Ojai, aren't formed yet. They haven't been formed yet. So these are, our, we're talking about the authorities, the powers, and the responsibilities of a GSA that's coming. It's not in place yet. Ken, we got another one right here beside you. <laughs> the slide that's up there right now talks about water rights and in a previous slide, uh, if I have it down correctly, it says that one of the authorities of the GSA is to, over, to investigate, appropriate and acquire surface rights, surface, er, surface rights, surface water rights, groundwater and groundwater, groundwater rights. How do those two things the agent, together? For example, think of it this way. If the agency has something in its plan and it wants to change land use in an area, it can buy that piece of property. That GSA could buy that piece of property and say, we're going to turn it into spreading basins, as an example, and we're going to acquire those water rights that come with that basin. Sounds pretty general, though, when you see it on the first. It is. It is very general. It is very general. Does it mean they're going to come take your water right? No, I don't think it has any, any intent to that at all. What it means is that they have the ability through implementation of the act in the projects that they might implement to acquire a water right if it's necessary to get to sustainability. Does it mean they're going to take the water right? I don't think it means to take the water right. I think it means they can, they can acquire and hold water rights. Yeah, we've got a mic back it, it, there. It seems like preparing these plans could be somewhat costly. Are there any funding sources from the state that would help GSAs in preparation of the plans? The, the short answer is, is yes. Rich, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, so in, in terms of funding, uh, yeah, as you know, voters just passed Proposition 1 in November, and that actually has a significant amount of funding for groundwater management and other activities in general. And then as part of the department's role um, in implementing uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we're also providing um, funding from our own discretionary budget related to facilitation services and some minor amounts for technical services as well. question on acquiring and you said you could acquire a piece of land and turn it into a spreading pool. Does the GSA have eminent domain rights? Good question. 
I said, does a G he just said that a GSA could acquire a piece of land and turn it into a spreading pool. So I said, does a GSA have eminent domain rights? I don't know the answer to that question. Rich, do you have any insight onto that? So I'm not a lawyer, but um, the GSAs are generally formed of public agencies, and those public agencies have, in certain cases, eminent domain rights, like the county may have that right. Um, Valid point. So maybe within their jurisdiction, not necessarily the GSA as a whole. Okay. So it depends on the type of GSA thing? Well, I think it depends on how they're formed, but I, again, I'm not a lawyer. Okay. Um, with all this, I can't imagine that anything could possibly go wrong. Um, is it going to turn into a food fight? Well, it possibly could. If you've seen Animal House, for those of you that are old enough, you'll, you'll get the idea. If, if everybody goes into their corner, raises their fisticuffs, and says, not me, um, then we've got a problem. There's going to have to be a certain level of cooperation and coordination between organizations and individuals to be able to meet these goals. Remember, the overarching goal was to take care of the business ourselves and not have DWR and the state come in and take over and, and run your basins for you. So um, to the extent possible, we need to get along and figure out a path forward through uh, all the requirements that are here. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot of the agencies from the Central Valley talk about is that the local agencies who may technically fall under the GSA eligible entities, they don't have technical expertise to handle this kind of thing. So where are they going to get the money to go hire consultants or hire staff to be able to implement a GSA kind of activity? Um, how will the sustainability funding be uh, uh, sustainability planning be funded, we kind of talked about that, um, that there is a, a pot of, of state money uh, available, but obviously all 125 basins are probably going to raise their hand in the air and say, can we have a little piece of that too? So I assume there will be a certain amount of competitiveness for that. How will the interests of everyone, ag, m and I, rural well owners, environmental uh, users be represented. I imagine there will be a, 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 a quite a number of stakeholder groups centered around each one of these major categories that will be providing input to the GSA organizations on their perspectives of what groundwater sustainability looks like and how they would perceive that we move forward and get to those goals. Okay. Remember the definition of undesirable impacts? You know, significant and unreasonable groundwater level declines, all those kinds of things. We've got to decide what is significant and what is, is undesirable on groundwater withdrawals. Those are local judgment decisions. There'll be technical input to that, of course, but those are decisions we have to talk about as a group as, as to how that's going to be addressed. And it's likely to be addressed a little bit different in each groundwater basin depending on their hydrologic situations there. Okay. What are we going to do about competing interests for water? We've got the one that always arises. It's M&I and Ag. But we've got a new significant player at the table, and that's the environmental water users. How are we going to integrate them into the process? Those who pump water have been talking about these kinds of issues off and on in our county for uh, quite a while. But now we have a new player uh, coming to the table who has uh, a stated role a stated role up here to be a part of the, uh, the process. So how are we going to, to do that? Okay. Then we need to talk about how, where the local communities are, are, are going to do. And the local communities meaning um, the various parties, the agricultural community, the M&I community, um, mutuals, everybody. And how are you going to adapt to these new regulations? People are going to have to talk and we're going to have to talk a lot about what needs to be done. But remember, we have a relatively short fuse to get things done, to get that plan prepared. Yeah, it's five years out, uh, roughly, 
Okay, but that gets burned up pretty quick when you talk about having multiple stakeholder meetings and there are 12 stakeholder groups and everybody has to review everything and we're trying to get to some sort of a consensus position on that. So that time frame will, will shrink rapidly as we get started. Okay, and there's more to come. There's follow-on legislation going on in Sacramento. Most of it is clarification. Some of it is those folks who are in the bargaining stage and they want to go back and, re and rewrite the law and, and get certain things in or out that were there before. I have a little document here. Here's a summary of groundwater bills that are being proposed right now and I've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pages three per page, so there's 27-ish bills on groundwater wandering around our legislature right now looking for um, uh, various levels of support. So there's going to be more to come on this. Okay. One of the things that, that is being talked about is streamlined adjudication. Is there a way that if we w go to the court and have the court determine our water rights and confirm our water rights, it, that is usually a 10, 20 year adventure you go down and is there a way for the court system to streamline that process and you know it depends on what attorney you talk to some have said they think a streamlined adjudication with appropriate cooperation from the court could be done in oh three to five years um, there's other folks who say that well streamlined means it's not 20 it's probably 13 um, years to get it done. So that's being worked on in Sacramento right now and there are a lot of parties at play in trying to figure out how would we do that, how could we speed this up if we, if people are going to go to adjudication, how would that, um, uh, how would that process go? And then we have uh, the DWR who are busily working on uh, the rules and guidelines that Rich is going to talk to us about uh, in a few moments. So I have a question. Um, I know California always thinks itself as unique, but <laughs> these problems are not things that haven't been talked about or dealt with in other location. Is there a, when the act was put together, was there any, what was the research behind other lessons learned from other states, other counties, and is there such a database of information that we can draw from? On the development of groundwater plans, is that what you mean? Or, well, there are a myriad of, of states that have plans, Colorado, Arizona, you know, they have programs on, on development of groundwater management plans and those kinds of things. Normally they don't call them sustainability plans, they're usually groundwater management plans uh, in the old uh, vernacular. So there are examples and, and things you can use out there as templates for you. Um, you know, on my computer right now, I have a draft template of the outline of a groundwater sustainability plan that's been put together by various people in the state as to, hey, this is something to get you started and, and begin thinking. Yeah, oh, hang on. Can we go part two over here? Back to the same place. Actually, I wasn't necessarily thinking of templates. I was thinking when I said lessons learned, I was also thinking of what has been successful and what hasn't been successful. And is there any place that we can turn to look and learn from? And whether it's sustainability or management, I think that it, that's, a, that's a semantic thing. I agree. I agree. Um, I know that there was a lot of discussion early on when Fran Pavley's bill was, was starting to be crafted and looking at examples of what other states had done. And so there was consideration of what looked to be effective in other areas. Does that stuff exist as a resource we can get our hands on? I'm not sure that it does. I don't know. I don't know. Yes. If there is going to be a food fight among uh, different <laughs> entities, um, is it just going to be a matter of a race who gets there first or with all their ducks in a row and it's approved by the state or, you know, how is that going to work? When are we going to actually know who our GSA is and who's involved in that? Can you hang on for the item three in the agenda today? Yeah. Okay. I think we'll talk about that in item three if you're good to hold on for a few minutes. Is United uh, compiling uh, suggestions for cleanup legislation to submit to, uh, to Sacramento? We've already submitted some suggested wording and had conversations with folks in, in, in the legislature about 
words that, that we would like to see adjusted. So we've already been down that path. Yes. So I hope at some point you're, you or someone's going to clarify sustainability, what the definition of that is. Um, no undesirable know, impacts. <laughs> well, <laughs> the reason I, I ask is because it's, it's very reminiscent of the AB 109, the, the prisoner realignment, right? When, you know, the counties were given all this money to help supervise and manage these return, returning offenders. And the, with the goal of reducing recidivism, yet they had no definition for recidivism, and the counties have struggled for a couple of years to determine what that is for baseline you know, evaluation and longitudinal studies. So with not knowing what sustainability is and the state not having guidelines, how are they going to review a plan and, and, and approve it for its sustainability? purposes if sustainability means different things in different basins? I think it's going to be partly how well you document and lay out your definitions locally of what sustainability means to you. What's an unreasonable decline in water levels? What's an unreasonable water quality degradation state for a basin? What's an unreasonable level of subsidence to occur? And, and You're going to have to locally define those as to what you think that is. Now, you have the DWR as a technical resource to say, we're thinking of this, does that look reasonable? I'm sure they'd be amenable to helping us work through those kinds of things. And we have plenty of technical experts out there who can help us sort through that. But I think the, the final peer reviewer is when your plan goes to DWR for their review, they have the ability to say, yeah, They've presented a good technical case. That makes sense for the hydrology of their basins. How does their re basins re basin respond during wet periods and dry periods? I think they have the ability to say, yeah, that looks like a reasonable way to do it, or no, it doesn't. And we, here's the following suggestions. Did I put too many words in your mouth, Rich? OK. <laughs> Uh, Tony, yeah, I, I think uh, part of the answer to I think part of the answer to the last two questions is I think we have to keep in mind that a cookie cutter approach, where a plan is on the table, we copy it and shoot it on its way, make a few minor adjustments, um, doesn't reflect the geological formation that causes water to flow in a particular area. And that's the huge variable in this whole matrix, is that every one of these plans have to reflect the hydrology and the interconnectivity of the basins and how water is moved underground through the surface, what the cropping patterns are, what the city patterns are. All of those variables, you can't take a cookie cutter answer and say this is exactly our plan again. And I think that then plays to what DWR has to do, is it has to look at each of these plans against the backstop of what is the hydrology in that particular area. Because if you don't understand the hydrology in that area, the plan doesn't make sense and you can't measure it. And I think that's one of the complexities that the GSA has to deal with, is that all of us in the state are in different areas and different geological formations, and that has a huge impact on how the water flows, where it goes, where it's reserved, and um, all those have to be accounted for. Yeah. Uh, my, my question involves a, a template of, a, of the uh, formation and government's type documents. Would be, is there going to be something that the department will put together so we don't all have, have to start from scratch with, with a team of lawyers that come up with appropriate citations for the authorities and powers and, and, and the citations within the water code and all those kinds of things? So that yeah, I, can see, I can see a real feeding day for the, some of these lawyers having to start from scratch. And it should be good if we had some coordinated efforts to where people had similar governance documents when they have similar problems. So as a question, as I understand, it has to do with the formation of the groundwater sustainability, sustainability agencies and 
is the state going to develop any kind of template that would support that? And right now we have not been looking at that, primarily because the legislation is pretty clear that the department doesn't have much role at all with respect to mm -hmm. defining sustainability agencies or even uh, proving them. So we uh, post the notices on our website. Um, so at this time we haven't thought about, we have received that kind of uh, request from several different areas and we're still thinking about you know, how far we can push those limits, but at least based on the legislation, there's no authority there for us to kind of define those. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just want to make a comment. I agree with what Lynn said and so when I made my previous comment about lessons learned I wasn't trying to talk about a template I do understand having the the baseline if you will of the legislation and the regulations we need to deal with but I am concerned about the definition of sustainability um, it's a term that gets kicked around in a lot of places and if you want to know how many dollars have gone down the <laughs> rat hole in health care because of sustainability, <laughs> I'm happy to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're going to talk about sustainability, I think it is dependent on locale, hydrology, mm -hmm. geology, mm -hmm. climatology, whatever. But what I'm worried about is that when you get to the top and somebody looks at the plan, they put it against the template that's static. So. I think if whatever we do has to make sure that there might be standards for review, but the baselines can change by location. So. Valid point. And I th my perspective on this is I know DWR is working on various uh, tasks that they've been given, and some of those are how are you going to review all these documents within the window and what criteria are you going to use and, and that kind of thing. This county is significantly ahead of many other counties in the state. There are areas that don't even report and haven't reported their groundwater. So they're trying to think about how they're going to write a sustainability plan and they have no data. They have nothing to use. So we're significantly farther down the road than they are. My perception is, is that we craft what we think would be a reasonable plan and we begin to open dialogue well ahead of our five-year deadline. We have that dialogue with DWR and begin to say these are the paths we're going down, this is what we're doing, and get some preliminary nods of the head that, yeah, that looks like a solid path to go down. That looks like a reasonable way to do that. Number one, we get a little bit of buy-in up front that we're going on the right path. Number two, we also help DWR because we're showing them a real-world example. If this is what people are coming up with on how they're going to get sustainability, how they're defining it, um, and what programs and what, what coordination between entities is going to be done to get them to achieve that. So they get to be able to feel as to what's the real world implications of this act going to be. How do those documents look when they come in? They're, they're not going to be six pages. I guarantee you that. Okay? They're not going to be a thin document. There's going to be a, a tree or two killed um, to, prepare those, to prepare those documents. So, back Does point. United have a recommendation um, as far as uh, oversight of the situation? Item three, today on the agenda. Oh, okay. We'll talk about that, what's going on locally. <coughs> Microphone. Oh, thank you. If an ad adjudication um, was made in an area years ago, how is uh, a basin or an area to know if that adjudication is sustainable. You may have an adjudication that's you know, really out of touch with reality and it's not sustainable. So you, you, there has to be a way to reconcile because it looks to me like adjudicated basins can opt out of all of this, but, but their plan may not be sustainable. Okay, the existing adjudications that are listed in the act are exempt by definition in, right. in the act. Okay, they still have to report, you know, pumping and those kinds of things. But it's a relatively minimal uh, obligation um, to remain in the exempt category. New adjudications are not necessarily exempt from the GSA process. Now, I'm not an attorney, and if there's five attorneys in the room, we'll probably get seven opinions on which way that goes. But 
My understanding is, and in talking to the attorneys both in Sacramento and here, is that new adjudications are not exempt. It's the list that was in there that are exempt. So if you want to go through an adjudication process, if I'm a judge, I'm saying, hmm, do you have a plan? You don't have a plan yet? Well, I need a plan. Do you have your sustainable yield figured out? You don't, or you do. Oh, well, I need that before I can go forward with the adjudication process. So you're going to end up in a situation where you're doing a lot of the things that the GSA would do as part of a GSP preparation anyway to get you through the adjudication process. Are there benefits, and I'll jump ahead to other things we'll talk about later, since we're on the topic. Are there benefits to the adjudication? Yeah, your water rights get confirmed by the court. Does that mean they're confirmed forever? Maybe. Maybe not. Water rights are usually defined based, and your, your ability to pump may not match. So the court says, you have 100, but things are not good in the basin right now, so you get to pump 80. That happens in adjudications right now. Okay? So it, those two may not match. Remember, you've got a five-year window for review of things. The court retains jurisdiction. They're going to want to review. If the hydrology changes, now how could the hydrology change in the basin and make your water rights then become uh, subject to reevaluation. Uh, let's say we have a basin and we're exporting water out of one end of the basin to an adjacent basin. Okay? And it's all balanced. We've done the plan, everybody's okay, it seems to work. But then your upstream neighbor decides, I'm going into water conservation and, and reuse and recycling big time. I'm not going to put much water back into the river anymore that I used to discharge from my water replenish or reclamation plant. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to recycle it within my town. And so now we've got a situation where there were exports out of the basin, pumping in the basin, water use within the basin, environmental uses of water within the basin, and the recharge component is suddenly now changed. Maybe not suddenly. It'll happen over a period of years. But it's now changed. Would that be a situation where you might want to go back and say, hey, our sustainability plan needs to be tweaked? The conditions are now different than where they, what they were when we first created the plan. Yeah, I can see that would be a situation where you would then go back to the court that had continued oversight with that adjudication and say, our conditions have changed. We need to relook at what the uh, pumping allocation distribution is within the basin. Okay, Tony, can I, can I interrupt for a second? Yes. I, I see a gentleman over here has one question, and I'm, I hate to be a clock watcher, but I am. Um, what I'd like to do is have you, you do uh, ask your question, and we'll see if we can answer it quickly, and then let's, let's go to DWR and go through that process. That will generate more questions. And I think, based on what I'm hearing, is when we get to phase three, where we talk about where we go forward, a whole bunch of other questions. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. So if I could do that. Fair enough. So, sir, if you want to ask your question, no, there's a gentleman in the corner behind you. Do, yes or no? Do you have a question? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Um, have you anticipated that you may end up having to do a habitat conservation plan much larger than the one you've already initiated for human diversion, i.e., if the Center for Biological Diversity challenges your uh, water management plan, uh, then you're going to maybe end up uh, having to do a, or agreeing to do a uh, ex much expanded HCP? I think that if, if they came in challenging the groundwater sustainability plan down the road, that's the responsibility of the GSA. The GSA would have to respond to that. It wouldn't necessarily be the individual entities of the GSA. Let's say three entities go together and they form a, a, a JPA. It's not the individual entities, it's the JPA's responsibility to say, okay, yeah, we have to do a sustainability plan, I mean a um, habitat conservation plan, or whatever it is we have to do. Um, so, yeah, those are things down the road well, that, yeah, that, that may or may not what, happen. I, I predict that's what's going to happen, and then you're going to end up, as part of the HCP, not only identify properties that are going to be set aside for habitat, but also uh, water that's going to be allocated towards, you know, wildlife and riverine uses, and then that's going to further decrease the amount of water available for, uh, you know, M&I and ag use, 
and then you're going to, that's going to ramp everybody's free production allowances down, okay. increasing let me, let, the let me water speak. they need to buy for makeup water. Okay, and sir. Hope let, later on you're going to talk about how you're coming up with the process for makeup okay. water. The, the short let answer me, is let me, possible. Let me see if I can inter yeah. interrupt here, because yeah. we, we can go on to a whole series of hypotheticals right now, and we are coming up at the midway point of our three hours. And so let's, let's shift, if you'll introduce uh, Rich from uh, DWR, let's shift to uh, DWR and let's go through that exercise. Can we take a two minute while we switch screens and, and um, speakers and mics and all that, Julian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 